I'm doing something a little bit different um, this Sunday. The author Basil Frederick Albert Copper died earlier this year on the 3rd of April 2013. The first um, story of his I ever read was uh, called Amber Print and basically it's a story about a man who searches and finds a print of an old movie only to find it's very very different from the movie that everyone else has seen. He's also written a number of, well he's quite famous basically, um, stories like the Academy of Pain, um, Beyond the Reef, Ill Met by Daylight, and Shaft Number 247, which I first read in New Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos, which was published in 1980. Anyway, I'm a fan of Mr. Copper. The story by him that I like best is a, a short novel called The Great White Space. And, well, it's copyrighted, so I can't read the whole thing. All I can do is read an excerpt. And so I've chosen half a chapter, which occurs approximately one third of the way into the book. Um, what is special about this story? Well, it's basically about uh, the Great Northern Expedition, run by a man called Clark Ashton Scarsdale, which basically is to explore a legendary opening to another universe found in a mountain range somewhere north on planet Earth. Um, I love the way he's incredibly vague about where exactly this northern place is, but you could you could possibly guess Tibet or maybe maybe Siberia. And um, basically, it's an adventure novel about exploration in an unknown part of the world. And um, I always loved these kind of stories when I was a kid, like Journey to the Center of the Earth, which I must have read about twenty or thirty times over and over and to a lesser extent Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost World. And, um, if you are lucky enough to be able to get hold of a copy of The Great White Space, well, you're in for a rattling good yarn. Just make sure you suspend your disbelief at the beginning. Here it is, a section of The Great White Space by Basil Copper. For two days we followed the winding contours of the valley, every hour rising higher and higher into the mountain range, whose arms almost imperceptibly and inevitably closed in behind us, until we all had the feeling that we were in a giant's grip. The wind increased daily, blowing in gusts from the heart of the range, but it did not trouble us as the desert wind, as there was little dust to obscure our view. It did, however, add to the difficulties of steering, and our vehicles tended to yaw from side to side so that one wearied at the handles and muscles craved relief from the buffeting, which went on hour after hour. It was growing steadily colder, too, though the sun shone as regularly as hitherto. This did not bother us at first, but we were then aware, during our frequent halts, that the breeze was a chilly one, and we were beginning to feel the benefit of the sheepskin-lined coats which was one of Scarsdale's strange-seeming requisitions for the expedition's stores. The way twisted and wound upwards, and for most of the time we were steering the tractors at half-speed through mazes of gigantic boulders and among formations of weirdly striated rock. But there had been no major difficulties. The tractors were standing up well to the wear and tear of this difficult going, and, most important of all, there had been so far no impossible places, no doubt due to Scarsdale's detailed surveying of the route on his previous journeyings. If there had been one impassable section, then that would have made the expedition untenable. Apart from our using the tractors as mobile bases, there was the sheer impossibility of transporting the masses of stores and equipment along these miles of pitiless moraine. The territory through which we were advancing was quite featureless. Black rock, boulders, stunted trees. Above a perpetually blue sky. Ahead, the eternal probe of the restless wind in one's teeth, and the jumble of rocks which indicated the next bend. We were too close in now to see what peaks lay ahead, and so far as one was aware, we were not high enough for snow. Scarsdale still continued in his mysterious and inscrutable way. Though his charts, log-books, and tables of weird hieroglyphs multiplied on the chart table in the command vehicle at night, he gave no detailed hints of what we might soon expect. 
we had been several days on our journey to the plateau when i myself broached the matter one evening he shook his head with an enigmatic smile we are not close enough yet was all he would say time enough when we are within the galleries he had with him a translation of the blasphemous book the ethics of igor which had been typed on ordinary foolscap sheets and he would be lost for hours in its study most evenings the smoke from his pipe curling upwards vertically in the still air of the tractor while in the desert we had kept within the machines wherever we stopped there was good reason for this of course the tractors were air-conditioned and the sand and grit constantly blown about made eating and conversation in the open air a misery but here just the opposite rule obtained though the air was cold and the wind blew chill whenever scarsdale called a halt over his radio link and all three vehicles drew into a rough lager we all of us without anyone ever putting it into words foregathered in the open air lit fires and cooked our food huddled in our sheepskin jackets and hoarding our precious gatherings of wood we drank our nightly tea ration and made the mountains echo with our animated talk van damme in particular made his own attitude plain i could read it well enough in his face though he never put the feeling into words we were whistling in the dark his taut features said to me every night as he gazed apprehensively around him at the dark rock whose jumbled surface was lit by the flickering flames of our necessarily feeble fires we all felt it now the mountains were closing in on us and inside the tractors the feeling was only emphasized when we were asleep this did not matter but until then we preferred to chat among ourselves lounge outside braving the wind downing the hot sweet tea in thirsty gulps and constantly scanning what little we could see of our surroundings but i noticed that none of us strayed outside the triangle of tractors in which the fires formed the cheerful focal points so far as we knew there was no wildlife in the mountains and no dangerous crevasses into which we might fall but still we did not wander day was a different matter but even there i noticed my companions rarely ventured more than a hundred yards or so from our established camp the only exception was scarsdale he was of course as i knew absolutely fearless and sometimes at night he would disappear for as long as half an hour at a time on some mysterious expedition of his own on the first occasion this happened i was consumed with alarm and was about to call my companions when he emerged from the darkness the small round glow of his pipe illuminating his bearded features his notebook was in his hand and there was an excited look in his eyes but i had learned my lesson by now and i did not venture to question him but i remembered that he had traversed this way alone and with none of the advantages that we five currently enjoyed and once more i marvelled at the tenacity and endurance of the man he had moral integrity as well as physical endurance and there were times as the weeks lengthened that i came near to adulation of our leader the great northern expedition was certainly the highest point in my wanderings in a life not entirely devoted to mundane things and even though the professor's purpose remained shrouded in obscurity i felt i would have followed him almost anywhere he chose to lead us we were four days traversing the gully towards the end the scree and the shattered boulders which lay like great shards of rock fallen from a region as remote as the moon made progress maddeningly slow but the tractors behaved extraordinarily well i think each of us underneath harboured a fear that the motors of the machines might overheat or that breakage of vital components would strand us here for that reason those of us who were driving nursed the vehicles along it was unlikely i reasoned that all three of the machines would break down but stranger things had happened i cast my mind back to my own adventures in the arizona desert and crosby patterson's terrible and unique fate and pictured what might happen to us were we thrown on our own resources and have to return on foot that outcome was unthinkable and i preferred instead to concentrate on my immediate duties i was pleased during the second day when scarsdale announced to me that he would himself take over the controls of the command tractor this left me for other duties not least those of my photographic recording activities and i secured one of the best sequences of the entire movie record the following afternoon with my series of swooping pans and tracking shots from the windows of our vehicle 
as we crawled inexorably into the higher plateau of the Black Mountains. It was a fearsome landscape into which we were slowly edging our way, and Scarsdale still had not revealed to us our exact destination, or what our role would be. He sat now, bracing himself in the padded seat, his great hands firm and steady on the levers, gently coaxing the power under his hands. The command vehicle would shudder, hang sickeningly on the edge of some unseen rock shelf, and then, with a lurching motion, step quietly into a higher plane, and then pressed again smoothly enough until the next obstacle was met. The mountain walls ahead now completely blotted out the sky, and for the last day or so the sun had disappeared. Everything around us was in purple shadow, and then we came out again round a shoulder of hill, and a high sun, spilling in from behind us somewhere, cast a pallid glimmer on the blackness of the shoulder of the mountain beyond. Nowhere was there any sparkle of light, or any relief in the sombre shade of these oppressive peaks. The wind still blew steadily, but seemed to have lost some of its sting, and the noise of our motors thrown back from the rocky walls each side of us seemed less sacrilegious. On the afternoon of the final day, the grating noise between the tractor's treads finally ceased, and we lurched along in an odd silence. It was near lunchtime when this happened, and Scarsdale gave the order over the radio for the party to halt for the break. I was down and out of the cabin door almost before we had stopped, and I gave an explanation. Scarsdale joined me at the door with an amused expression in his eyes. I then saw the reason for the unexpected silence. Stretching behind us, like the slime track left by a gigantic slug, was our own trail. Every scratch and indentation on the tractor treads reproduced exactly on the surface of the gully. I printed my own footmarks behind me as I ran back towards Van Damme's tractor, which was just turning the bend. The entire floor of the valley was lined with black sand, a unique and extraordinary sight. If it had not been for the perennial blue of the sky above us, the effect would have been overwhelming in the morbid darkness like an engraving to illustrate the stories of Poe, or a work by Doré, or Samuel Palmer, the black mountains literally ingested us. They were above, behind, and before us, and now their own ebony opaqueness stretched beneath our feet. Van Damme had joined me, and then the others. The tractors were formed into the familiar triangle, and we all stood about, talking little, overcome by this bitter darkness which blackened our very spirits. Only Scarsdale seemed unmoved. In fact, his demeanour was positively jaunty under the circumstances, and he gave out at great length over our alfresco lunch on the nearness of our destination and the positive tasks on which we would shortly be engaged. We were under way again within the hour, and the soft crunching of our progress along this dark sea of sand combined with the whine of the motors to lull my mind into a semblance of rest. The far-off rays of the sun had disappeared behind the far hills long ago, but the light in the sky was still brilliant when I looked through the windscreen and saw that the way before us was at last blocked. Darkness stretched supreme from the black floor of sand to the dizzy heights of the mountain peak far above us. Scarsdale drove the tractors onwards, over a hummocked ridge, where the sand lay in strange whirls like the casts of crabs, presumably sculptured by the wind. I got out of the tractor. The sand terrace sloped away from me gently towards the face of the cliff, darkness married with darkness in the gigantic face of rock before me. The echo of something like great wings broke the silence as the other two tractors wind to a halt, our companions leaping to the ground. I found a crack in the rock formation with my eye, following it up to misty heights like a gothic cathedral. A huge shard of rock breaking out of the sea of sombre sand shocked with its pallidity. I walked over to it. The rock, white and crystalline like quartz, shone like a blasphemy in that place of shadows. My suddenly shaking hand traced out the outlines of strange and obscenely shaped hieroglyphs upon it. It seemed to point like a finger towards the entrance which beckoned before us. I turned to look again as Scarsdale walked towards me. A warm wind blew out of the cliff, and with it the memories and associations of something far off and long ago. My eyes raked the cliff again, refusing to believe what they saw. A hewn doorway in the black basaltic surface of the natural rock. 
a doorway, that seemed to lead to the utmost depths of the earth. A doorway, moreover, that must have been all of five hundred feet high. 